Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. Our next guest wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times this week, and it was titled, Companies that tap U.S. relief packages must be more transparent. The public deserves to know how they will protect the well-being of their employees, customers, and the planet. Joining us right now is Lynn Forrester, de Rothschild, founder of the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. She's also the CEO of the investment office, uh, E.L. Rothschild. And uh, Lady Lynn, it's great to have you on the program this morning. Um, you, you wrote a fascinating, fascinating piece. The, the question I'd ask you is, who should be responsible for all of this? Is it the government that should be required to force companies to make these disclosures? Should it be the companies themselves? Should it be some private-public partnership? How is it supposed to work? Well, first of all, we saw last year when Corona referred to a beer, not to a crisis, that the business roundtable CEOs stepped up and they said that they are going to dedicate themselves to all their stakeholders, to their customers, to their employees, to their community, and to the planet. Davos was all about stakeholder capitalism. And so we have a movement among corporates that this is important. However, from an investor's point of view, unless the metrics about how a company is taking care of its people and planet are standardized and assurable, you really can't invest properly. You can't really be an employee who understands the difference between employee treatment at the different companies in the same industry. And as a consumer, you don't really know. So what I'm arguing for is let's get standardized metrics that are material and are not overly costly to companies. Because right now, trying to do this on a voluntary basis, and we have great companies in this country who truly are taking care of their people and their planet, but they put out glossy reports and there's happy talk. It's very difficult to sort out the best and create a real race to the top not only on financial measures, which are, of course, important, but also on these non-financial measures. So I'm arguing that government should right. create yep. a body to, to create these metrics. They won't be perfect, but they'll be something. Lady Lynn, let me ask you this, though. You know, in this environment, given the challenges of the economy, and we talked to a lot of investors over the past couple of weeks. We say, is ESG more important or less important? A lot of, a lot of investors say it's more important or it's as important as ever. However, you, you then think about the balance sheet of businesses in this environment. You think about the deltas of, of the world who had committed uh, to uh, spend $100 million a year on climate and, and carbon offsets. You think about Microsoft and the, 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 the plans that they have. Are we, can we really expect companies in this environment to actually follow through with some of these proposals, not because they were disingenuous proposals, but because the world has changed and made it that much more complicated and difficult? And, for example, if the real goal is to help employees, and I'm, I'm, as you know, I want to help the climate, too, you have to start to think about where you're going to allocate your resources. Well, of course that's true, and that decision is different for different companies in different industries. It's different for tech than it is for retail, for instance. But the point is that, when, that we went into this with an inequality where the top one-tenth of one percent of Americans own 23 percent of our wealth. That's 160,000 Americans who own wealth that is equivalent to 290 people in America. If we go in to the autumn, or we, or we, at, we get out of this crisis with tens of millions of people unemployed, right now one out of six Americans is unemployed, that is not an environment that is safe for businesses. So, um, of course, you have to make decisions and you have to be proportionate among all your stakeholders, not only your employees, but obviously also your shareholders. But if any board is not thinking about the risk of something like Occupy Wall Street times a thousand, if we don't begin to give the public real, true understanding that our best companies are the ones that are taking care of their workers and their customers and their planet, and thank God there are a lot of them that are doing it, uh, uh, it, Andrew, I thought you, uh, uh, 
you ask about climate change and carbon offsets, and I guess it is interchangeable to a lot of people in ESG, but you just answered that entire question based on income inequality. I just... Well, there's the, the climate, the climate uh, issue. I, I agree, Joe. That is another one that is very important for the long term. That was viability the one Andrew asked you about. Uh, that was the one Andrew asked you about. And suddenly, but you are able so facilely to, to go back and forth. And I, I see with ESG people, it you re, it's just all the any any. It just to me, it just sounds like any of the virtue signaling. Uh, things. You, you, it doesn't even matter which question that, that someone asks you. You go just as easily between climate change and income inequality, and it's like it's all the same thing. And I, I don't know. I, I just thought it was funny that he asked you specifically about carbon offsets, and we came back with, uh, you know, that we're going to have Occupy Wall Street problems. Uh, Joe, uh, I happen I'll, to I'll take it. Go ahead. Well, I just didn't understand go, it. Go ahead, I, I, was, I was interested. I thought Andrew was doing really well with, because I don't know how with oil down where it is right now, it's, and you, we just want people employed, and we want people, you know, to, to be able to get a paycheck, and we want our companies to be competitive globally. So it's going to be hard to make that transition to, to much more expensive renewable-type energies at $20 oil. So it doesn't seem like the time. I, I know that, you know, all the climate people say a good crisis. We got it. This is the time to see what it would be like if everyone stayed home for the climate. But it just doesn't seem like an ideal time to... Uh, to be th thinking about that when we just want to get people back to work and energy needs to be as cheap as it possibly can right now. Oh, look, at, that's, that's a short-term view, and in the long term, we have to protect our planet, and I do think that we have to deal, frankly, with the inequality problem and the climate problem concurrently. And it's complicated, uh, and a lot of businesses that are in alternatives are, are some of the most innovative in the world, and they are going to provide energy that is clean because it is an existential threat over the long term. So right. we understand that. Hey, Lynn, before we let you go, one question. You talked about what may happen on the other side of this pandemic, and I'm very curious if how you think this is going to change business, dare I say the word, capitalism, taxes, all of it, in an environment right now where clearly there are at least questions about whether the, there is a free market, uh, given the, the, the government has come to the rescue, not just here in the United States, but around the world. You could, you could argue we, we, this is corporate welfare at the moment. Uh, the question is, you know, how you think that changes the conversation after? I think it changes capitalism forever, just like Leon Cooperman said on your, on your show last week. He said, you know, when government is called upon to protect on the downside, it has a right to regulate on the upside. And I don't think it's a winning argument to use, you know, neoliberal arguments against regulation when we are putting trillions and trillions of public m money into the private market. So I think we have to reform capitalism, and um, it's the same thing that happened after the, after the Depression. Capitalism changed, and it therefore saved capitalism. But when we have the private sector getting trillions of dollars, it can expect government to regulate for those 290 people, million people. 